Hello, and welcome to the lecture on the simple harmonic motion of pendulums. Now, if you're not sure what simple harmonic motion is, you should review the last lecture, although I will touch on some of the key ideas in order to justify why pendulums can be thought of with a reasonable approximation as a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, so let's get to it. All right, so we're we'll all talking all about pendulums here. All right, so I'm swinging back and forth under the force of gravity. Okay, so let's look at our key terms. So we want to talk about the pendulum restoring force, okay? And so for a spring, the restoring force is, well, it's the spring force. It, that's what we call it, okay? It's defined by Hooke's law, and it always opposes the motion. It wants to restore the spring to its rest length, okay? For a pendulum, the restoring force is gravity, right? Because gravity wants to bring the pendulum back down to the bottom of the swing, okay? So... That's the idea that should make both the systems be harmonic oscillators because they both have a force that wants to return the object to its equilibrium point, okay? A stable equilibrium at the bottom of the swing for a pendulum, all right? And if you recall, the other premise, the definition of the simple harmonic oscillator was that that restoring force had to be linear. Hold that thought, okay? In other words, directly proportional, all right? Okay, so now let's remind ourselves the difference between physical and simple pendulums because that's going to come up in this discussion of their oscillation. All right, so first of all, a simple pendulum is the, the one like the one shown here. It has all of its mass at one point. So M would be the entirety of its mass. So it, it is hanging from a string or a cord or something that is of negligible mass, which we take to be zero. Okay, and then we don't even worry about the mass being a sphere or anything like that. It's just a single point mass. So it's an idealization or a simplification. Okay, next up is a physical pendulum, and I have one drawn down here. Okay, so a physical pendulum is a pendulum that has a distribution of mass. Those are like any real object. In this case, our physical pendulum is showing to be a baseball bat. Often it's like a rod. We're going to see a physical pendulum as a ring that's kind of pivoting about one point. So it's just any object that has a distribution of mass. In order for it to be really easy to deal with, it's usually a nice geometric distribution of mass, not some odd shape, but that's a physical pendulum. Okay? All right. So we'll talk about both types here when we talk about their time-dependent um, oscillatory motion. Okay? And then we have another term, the center of oscillation. This is a really neat idea. It's the sweet spot. Okay, this is actually what it's called sometimes. And we all have a, per a picture down here. This is another physical pendulum right here. For example, a meter stick. And this point P is the center of oscillation. The point C, by the way, is the center of mass. Notice that the center of oscillation is not at the center of mass. In fact, it's below the center of mass. And notice drawn in the same figure is a simple pendulum with a point mass M. And the length of that simple pendulum is equal to the distance from the pivot to the center of oscillation for the physical pendulum, right? So that, that's the way that we can define the center of oscillation. It is the point measured from the pivot that is equivalent to the length of a simple pendulum that has the same period as the physical pendulum, okay? So it's, in a sense, it's almost like simplifying a physical pendulum into a simple pendulum. If you were to replace this physical pendulum with a simple pendulum, and you wanted the replacement to have the same period as the original pendulum, then you'd want to make sure that your replacement was as long as the distance from the pivot to the center of oscillation. But why do we call it the sweet, sweet spot? And why is it also sometimes called the center of percussion? Well, because if an impact, like an impulse, is applied to the center of oscillation, then there will be no translation at the pivot point. If an impulse is applied at any other location, then there will be translation at the pivot point, either translation in the, in the negative direction or the positive direction, depending on the impulses above or below the pivot point. And we won't ever, I won't ever ask you to solve for that, that translation, nor figure out whether you know, it's above or below. You can look into that if you're interested. But think about that. what that means. That means if you hit a pendulum at any spot other than the center of oscillation, then this part up here is going to vibrate. It's going to shake. It's going to want to, want to, you know, to wiggle back and forth. So think about a baseball bat. If I hit a baseball bat at the center of percussion, the sweet spot, or if I hit a baseball with that bat at the center of oscillation, the sweet spot, then the baseball where it's being held, which is the pivot point, is not going to want to translate. 
That way you don't get like, you wouldn't get vibrations in your hand. If you hit a baseball at any other spot, then you are going to get vibrations in your hand. There's, that's where the name comes from, okay? That's the idea of the center of oscillation. But it's interesting that mathematically and mechanically, it's, it's a matter of, of replacing, replacing the physical pendulum with the simple pendulum, okay? All right, so that's it for our key terms, all right? Now let's talk about the mathematical background that shows that a pendulum, both physical or simple, can be treated like a simple harmonic oscillator. All right, and thus it will then have position functions that are sine or you know sine or cosine and so on, right? And velocity functions and acceleration functions, just like the ones we saw for the spring. Okay, so let's look at that because I kind of have a mini derivation here to justify why we can treat the pendulum as a simple harmonic oscillator. So let's look at that in our key equations right over here. Okay, so our first equation is torque. Okay, now it makes sense we're talking about torque because we are talking about a rotational system, okay? So you can think of this as the restoring force. Well, except now it's a restoring torque, okay? That's fine, right? It's, there's, the force of gravity is still, the, is still you know, the driving restoring force, but that force of gravity creates a gravitational torque. So that's your restoring gravitational torque, all right? And then, that, then we have H. This shows up in the figure here at the baseball bat. That is the distance from the pivot to the center of mass. We always need to know that because that's the only place where the gravitational force acts by definition, okay? As shown in the figure. Next up is the gravitational, or the angle of the pendulum with the vertical, all right? That's that angle right there. That's just the, the displacement. We're gonna come back to that angle because it turns out that angle is an important part of the story, all right? But we've, we're familiar with that idea. You release, you release a pendulum from a particular angle, then it swings down. And of course, that's gonna tell you how much initial um, potential energy you have, okay? Which will then you know, get converted into kinetic energy at the bottom of the swing. And then we got the gravitational force, okay? Fg just equals mg. That force right there, okay? All right, now, what's going on with this next line? So here I'm saying that sine theta is approximately tangent theta is approximately theta, right? So this is, this is a thing in math, and it's, it's employed a lot in physics. It's called the small angle approximation, okay? So the reason we're gonna do it is because we're looking to get that direct proportionality between force and um, displacement. We want, because otherwise we don't, the math wouldn't give us the same functions. We need the direct proportionality. We need like, like in Hooke's law, it was a linear relationship between spring force and displacement X. And what was the, the slope of that linear relationship? The spring constant, okay? So we need something the same for, for pendulums. But we don't get it because we're stuck with a trig function. So we have to get rid of that trig function, all right? And the way we can do that is as long as we're working in radians, the numerical value of sine theta is actually equal to the angle itself in radians as long as the angle is less than or equal to 12 degrees. Now it's not perfectly equal, but it becomes so close that we're talking a fraction of a fraction of a percent, okay? Especially for like angles like five degrees. So it's actually a very reasonable approximation. And here we have our linearity because look what our torque equation becomes, okay? So this right here was our basically our net torque, because there's only a single force, only a single torque, the gravitational torque. Before, it would have been hmg times sine theta, but now it's just hmg times theta, okay? This is now a linear equation, not a trigonometric equation. And then by Newton's second law, it's gonna be equal to I alpha, okay? All right, so now we've got our equation, all right? And it has the same form. It's got the appropriate form for the simple harmonic oscillator. Because think about what it was before, right? It was just kx equals ma, okay? And then of course, you know, that's, that's what led to the, you know, the proposed solution, the solution that works, which is cosine, okay? So that means that we've, we've replaced k with hmg, okay? So k is replaced by hmg, okay? Because think about what the, in the angular frequency was before for the spring. It was the square root of k over m, okay? All right, so that, that was, those are the physical parameters to find how quickly the system you know, oscillated. But now what's, what has replaced m? Well, of course, m has been replaced by i, the moment of inertia. All right, so we, but it's the same form, as long as the angle is less than pi over 12, which is about 15 degrees, okay? if you convert to, convert to degrees. So there we have it. We have an angular frequency for the pendulum oscillator, the pendulum simple harmonic oscillator, 
right? And it's got a similar form. And just like the spring, it's dependent only on the physical parameters of the pendulum. The distance from the pivot to the center of mass, the mass of the pendulum itself, where we are, what the gravitational acceleration is, and then the mass distribution of the pendulum, which is its moment of inertia, okay? All right, and then by definition, omega is always just equal to two pi over the period, and omega is also equal to two pi times frequency, which is, you know, so this is, this is frequency and this is angular frequency. Okay, moment of inertia, and so on. Okay, and do note that for simple pendulums, because the moment of inertia is just ml squared, right, that's, that is the moment of inertia for any tethered particle, which is a simple pendulum, it's a point mass, right, some distance away from the pivot. It's, remember, it's also the moment of inertia of a hoop, because that has the sim similarity of having all of its mass a certain distance away from the pivot, so it's effectively a point mass, a, a, a perfectly thin hoop is. In those cases, the moment of inertia is the largest moment of inertia that exists, which is ml squared, and so if we substitute in ml squared for i, then our m's cancel, one of our l's cancel, and we get this really nice, simple um, angular frequency, which is even more similar to the angular frequency of a spring, because the spring was, you know, was k over m, now k is g, and m is l. Okay, All right. That's you know they kind of like functionally switched out like that. Okay, so here we here we have the angular frequency of a simple pendulum. This comes up a lot, right? Because a lot of times we have we have systems that we can simplify to being a simple pendulum, and there you have it. Okay. Now, that means we should be able to write a position function, a velocity function, and an acceleration function. All just using the same rules, the same idea of the phase angle shifts. And I won't go into all those details, but if you want to see the, the, the relationship between position for a simple harmonic oscillator, velocity for a simple harmonic oscillator, and acceleration for a simple harmonic oscillator, and why they're all just phase shifted trig functions. You know, once, once you have you know, this, this relationship and the, and the linearity between the restoring force and, the, and the, um, you know, the displacement, then look at the previous set of lecture notes. Okay, that's where I, I get into that idea. So this, these are the resulting functions. They're, they're exactly the same now. It's just that we, you know, we start with cosine, our amplitude now is an angular amplitude, and our displacement is an angular displacement, right? So that means that we have a, our displacement here isn't in measured in meters, like it would be for a spring, but instead it's measured in, you guessed it, radians, okay? Well, radians, not pi, okay? So it's measured in radians. So that means the amplitude is also in radians. The angular frequency, right, it's, it's this, right? Or for a simple pendulum, it's this, right? And it's time dependent, okay? Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing, though, is how are we going to express the angular velocity function? Because angular velocity before, you know, in our chapters on rotation was omega, right? And omega, you know, equals V over R, okay? Well, that's great. That, that's always been, you know, angular velocity. But here we have angular frequency, which is omega. Was angular frequency and angular velocity the same? No, definitely not. Because angular velocity changes, it has to. Think about the pendulum. If I start a pendulum up here, it starts from rest, it speeds up, it reaches some maximum angular velocity at the bottom, omega max, then it slows down. So the angular velocity is absolutely sinusoidal. Okay, so this is angular velocity, and then this is t. But wait, but omega represents angular frequency, which is a constant, so this can't be right. So we have to give up that variable. We have to, we have to give up the letter, because it's being reserved for angular frequency. So we're going to use a different letter for angular velocity. But to make it more clear, rather than just saying, oh, well, now we're going to use the letter Q or something, which would be kind of hard to remember. Instead, we're going to use theta with a dot over it, which I suppose is also hard to remember at first pass, but it makes sense. Because the, we, what we're representing here is we're taking steps kinematically. All right. So we go from position to velocity, which is one dot. And then we go to angular acceleration, which is two dots. So we can really clearly see there's a relationship between position, velocity, and angular acceleration. All right? So angular position, angular velocity, angular acceleration. All right? So before, the variables would have been, just to be clear on this, theta, omega, and alpha. But we're replacing omega and alpha with theta dot and theta double dot. Okay? And, to be, and also, to be doubly fair, alpha isn't serving any other purpose here. We could have just gone back and called this alpha, but then that would have made this, this term even stranger looking, all right? So instead, I want to clearly show that these are related. These are the kinematic equations, position, velocity, and acceleration, all right? And the idea, is, of course, is because velocity is the change in position. It's the instantaneous change in position. You can think of this dot as representing a change, 
and then um, and then angular acceleration is the instant instantaneous change in angular velocity. So then you're taking the dot of the thing that has a dot, so it's a double dot, right? And I'll refer to these as theta dot and theta double dot, okay? But they they take the same form, right? You know the amplitude idea looks the same. Before you know for a spring this would have been a. For a spring, this would have been omega a, but now it's omega theta max. And then for, um, a, for acceleration, for a spring, it would have been omega squared a. Now it's just omega squared theta max, right? But this is, this is the acceleration of the, or the amplitude of the acceleration. This is the amplitude of the velocity, and this is the amplitude of the displacement, okay? And they, and they, take, they, they have the same phase shifts, cosine to negative sine, sine to negative cosine, okay? So we're hopefully we're good there. We'll put them to use, all right? So let's get into our practice problems. All right, so we've got four types of practice problems. Type one, simple problems that involve simple pendulums and calculating the frequency and period. Type two, problems that involve simple pendulum um, and finding angular position, velocity, and acceleration for specified time. So just using the function, just plug, plugging in you know, the values of amplitude and angular frequency and so on, maybe based on some information that we needed. Um, may also involve finding translational acceleration and tension at specified times, because we can then use our expressions and plug those into known equations for, um, you know, for, free, um, for tension or um, translational terms, okay? Type three, problems that involve a relating a physical pendulum to a simple pendulum using the center of oscillation. That's, that's a problem where we're just gonna use that relationship where their, their um, periods are equal to each other, okay? The, the, um, the, the simpler pendulum replacement, okay? And then finally type four, fairly complex problems that involve physical pendulums and finding um, position, velocity, and acceleration for specified times. And to be fair, I have one um, example that's a type two problem that is probably the trickiest of all of them, just ends up having a lot of steps to it. So I guess we could call a type two also fairly complex. Okay, so example one. A simple pendulum with a rigid mass of string of length 1.75 meters is pulled to a small angle um, above equilibrium and released from rest. Part A, what is the period of this pendulum swing? If this pendulum is instead swung on, on Jupiter's, mood, Ga Jupiter's moon Ganymede, and it makes exactly 14 swings in 97.3 seconds, what is your weight on Ganymede as a percentage of your Earth weight? Oh, okay, how are we gonna figure that out, right? Well, let's do part A, the simpler one, okay? So what is the period of the pendulum swing, okay? So we were given a length and, right, we don't, we don't need the mass, right, but we need gravity. So we'll go ahead and then say, okay, well, angular frequency is two pi f, which is two pi over t, which means then t is just two pi over omega. And then we can replace omega with L over G because it's a simple pendulum. We have L and we're on Earth, so we, we know what G is. So we plug in our length, gravitational acceleration on Earth, and there's our period, 2.66 seconds, okay? So, you know, this is a pretty long pendulum. It's like five feet long. And so when we, you know, we, when we let it swing, it makes a swing that takes 2.66 seconds. So that's a complete swing. A complete swing, swing would be like, imagine lifting the pendulum up, not too high because it's gotta be a small angle for this to work and then releasing it, letting it swing to the other side away from you, and then when it comes back to you, it's completed the full swing. So it'll pass through equilibrium twice every full swing. Um, furthermore, this, as I said, this is a pretty, this is a pretty slow swing because it's a long pendulum. Notice that it's, it's independent, the period of the swing is independent of the mass. We should expect that because just like, you know, free fall is independent of the mass. And also notice it has independent of the angle. Why is it independent of the angle? Because of the small angle approximation, okay? All right. Now, what about taking it to Ganymede? So first of all, we need to piece together information we, get, we were given to find the, um, the period. Not too much, basically. We just had 14 swings in you know, about a minute and a half. So we just take the time and divide by the number of swings, and that will give us the time per swing, so 6.95 seconds. Great. That means it's swinging slower on Ganymede. Well, what would make something swing slower if it's the same pendulum with the same length? Less gravity. And there is, in fact, much less gravity on Ganymede, okay? So it, it should swing slower. If you have less gravity, then you have a slower swing. If you have more gravity, you have a faster swing, okay? And then we're just gonna set this period by definition equal to two pi by the square root of the length over the gravity on Ganymede. So this is G sub Gan. And then we're just gonna solve for that. All I've done here is just isolate it, right, with our known variables, okay? And then plug in the numbers, okay? Including um, the period on Ganymede. And what do we get? 1.43 meters per second squared. That is gravitational acceleration on the surface of Ganymede and we found it by swinging a pendulum. A swinging pendulum is actually thought of as one of the go-to ways of finding gravitational acceleration, right? It's a, it's a common laboratory experience, find, find gravitational acceleration. You can measure things in free fall, that's sometimes impractical. The pendulum is nice because it's, it's more repeatable, it, there's less, less chance of error, and you can get a really good and accurate measurement of gravitational acceleration, okay? 
And then um, we're asked for, what does that say about your weight? Well, we can take the ratio of gravitational accelerations, 1.43 on Ganymede divided by 9.8 on Earth, and we end up with a, a fractional um, representation of 0.146. In other words, you're 14.6 times as heavy on Ganymede as you are on Earth. All right, so you're much lighter, okay? You, you, know, you only weigh a seventh of your, your, your Earth weight. All right, example two. A simple pendulum with a string length of L, and I meant to give the value here, so that was a typo, 1.2 meters, is attached to a ceiling of an elevator that is accelerating. What must be the magnitude and direction of the elevator's acceleration if the pendulum has a period of two seconds? So this is so interesting, right? Because here's the idea. Accelerating elevators can act like artificial gravity. It'd be like being on a planet, right? With either more gravity or less, less gravity. And it'd be more gravity if the elevator was accelerated up and less if it was going down. And, you know, we've seen that before of Newton's third law, so this might sound familiar. And also it should make sense because if you think of an elevator as in free fall, well, you, a pendulum wouldn't swing at all, right? It would just stay wherever it is and it swing, right? It'd be like the, you know, the, the astronauts in the International Space Station. They don't, they don't have grandfather clocks, you know, keeping time because pendulums don't swing when you're in free fall, okay? All right, but this, this case is not free fall because it is going to swing. So let's, let's figure out if it's swinging faster or slower than it would normally. All right, so we're back on Earth, first of all. All right, we'll use um, the definition of the period of a, a pendulum related to its length and gravity. And here I call it effective gravity, okay? And that's due to the acceleration of the elevator because the elevator is a non-inertial reference frame, all right? So the idea here is this isn't truly an acceleration, it's just an apparent acceleration. And we're, so we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're acknowledging that and then finding it and then using Newton's second law to find the acceleration of the non-inertial reference frame, the elevator, to the inertial reference frame, Earth. Okay, that's of course assuming Earth's at rest. Okay, and then we'll just go ahead and find the effective um, gravitational acceleration to give this period, all right? Plug in all our values, all right? Basically, this is the length in the period in four pi. Okay, don't forget the square four pi. And we get, um, I left it off here. I did, I did do it in the calculation, but I left off a two. I'll have to fix that with the upload. And then we get 3.77 meters per second squared. Oh, well that's definitely less than normal gravitational acceleration. So that means that the elevator must be accelerating down. That's the only way you could be effectively lighter. That's the only way you can make the pendulum swing slower because this period is longer than it would be otherwise, okay? And so then to go ahead to find the acceleration of the, um, the elevator, we acknowledge that the effective gravitational acceleration is just G plus the acceleration of the elevator. And in this case, that means that the acceleration of the elevator must be negative. In fact, it must be the difference and it's negative 6.03 meters per second squared, okay? So it's a pretty fast downward moving elevator, but that's the idea, okay? All right, so good, I hope that example makes sense. And again, I will fix this, leaving off the square there. Okay, all right, so this is, this is that one I'd, I'd warned you about. Um, this is a, a rather um, complicated example. It's just got a lot of steps to it. So, a simple pendulum with a rigid mass, at least it's a simple pendulum, with a rigid mass of string of length 1.75 meters, and by the way, rigid mass of string is always the case for simple pendulums, um, and a bob mass of 1.3 kilograms, that's just the point mass at the end, it's pulled to an angle of eight degrees, all right, above equilibrium. That definitely, um, you know, qualifies for the, uh, the small angle approximation. We'll have to convert this to radians at some point, by the way. All right, and that's at t equals zero. And then it's released. What is the equation of angular motion for the simple harmonic motion of this pendulum? What angle above equilibrium will the pendulum have when its angular velocity is 0.3 radians per second? I had a typo here where I'd, I'd written this as 30 centimeters per second. I meant to write 30 center radians per second, but then I, I decided it would be better, in, you know, instead of writing center radians, just write 0.3 radians per second, okay? And then part, um, in part C, um, we're then, then gonna be asked, what is the tension in the string and the magnitude of the total translational acceleration after one second? Oh wow, okay, we're gonna have to find tension and total translational acceleration. And if you recall total translational acceleration, it was one of those, one of those long equations that basically said that total was equal to the square root of the radial component plus the tangential component. All right, so that's what we're gonna be seeing, okay? So that, that, there's a lot of numbers to plug in at that point. Okay, all right, but let's do part A first. What is the equation of angular motion for this pendulum? Okay, all right, so this, this is what the equation, this is the form it's gonna take, okay, all right. And let's think about what we know. For, so first of all, theta max, we know it. We just have to convert eight degrees into radians and it ends up being 0.14 radians, I'm looking good. And we know angular frequency because we know gravity and we know the length, right? It's, a, it's the same length pendulum as the one in the elevator, all right? And so there we have it. There is our angular frequency, 2.37 radians per second. Wonderful, all right? And so then we just put, put all that information in and we've got ourselves our equation of motion, okay? There it is, okay? And I, I forgot to put a box around it, see? 
but that it's, you know, it's got its amplitude in front, it's got cosine of omega t, right? And so this, this is an equation that we'd use for any particular time. So if I wanted to find where the pendulum was located at a particular time, I would use this equation, okay? And it's the, and you would also, the initial values are going to be positive, right? Because if you think about the pendulum, the initial values here are, this is in the positive theta direction, okay? So, if, so since we're using cosine, not negative cosine, we're assuming that we lift the pendulum up in the positive theta direction. Remember, positive theta is defined as counterclockwise. That means every pendulum, if you're imagining in your head, is lifted up a certain number of degrees, theta max, when it's, you know, it's released, a certain number of degrees in the counterclockwise direction, okay? So up until a quarter of the wavelength, theta will remain positive. Why, I'm the quarter of the period, excuse me. Because why a quarter of the period? Because it takes a quarter of the period to swing down to equilibrium the first time, right? Then it takes another quarter to swing back up to here, then another quarter period to swing back to equilibrium, and then finally the, the fourth and final quarter to get back to where it started, okay? But that means for the first quarter period of time, the angular position of the pendulum will be positive. After that, after one quarter, then it's gonna pass over into this region. This is the negative theta region because it's on the other side of equilibrium. Okay, that's defined as negative position. Just like a spring, you define compression as positive and extension as negative, or vice versa. Here, we're always going to define lifting it in the counterclockwise direction as positive theta, just to you know, be, always be clear and consistent on that. Okay? But that's, that's, that's the coordinate system. And it's, it's always good to have a clear understanding of the coordinate system we're talking about. Okay? All right, so part B. Find the time from, angular, from, from the angular velocity function. Okay? All right, because, uh, oh, by the way, just to remind you, we're, we're asked what angle of equilibrium will the pendulum have when its angular velocity is this, okay? All right, now we could, we could actually do this with conservation of energy as well, all right? Um, but here we're gonna do it, go ahead and do it using our, our equations of motion, all right? So essentially, I'm gonna take the velocity equation, the theta dot equation, and I'm gonna set it equal to a specified value of 0.3, okay? Well, it's the, the equation is negative omega theta max times sine of omega t, all right? And that's, that's what we have right here, okay? And I left, there's a parenthesis missing, but it's still there, okay? And so then we just need to so, um, solve for t. So I'm just gonna you know, divide both sides by negative 2.37, right? This is our maximum angular velocity, all right? And then I'll take a sine inverse to find t, and there's our number. Negative, uh-oh, we can't have a negative time. That doesn't make any sense. We must have made a mistake. Um, nope, no we didn't, okay? And that's because Although the negative time does not make physical sense, it tells us that we just need a phase shift, okay? Now, we're not doing initial phase shifts to define our position functions or anything, but this is just, this is just a phase shift that's necessary to consider. I know they're kind of tricky, but the idea is that here is our negative, one, you know, our negative amount of time, okay? And then we need to, I summarize that for some reason it has a negative 1.13, that was a different version. It should be negative 0 0.479. But you get the idea. This is, this is a certain fraction of a phase shift but then we can then move forward and find out the actual time that will correspond to that, okay? And when I say actual time, I mean positive time. Because think about what's happening here. Think about the coordinate system I was just talking about a moment ago. We release the mass, okay? And what, what is its initial velocity, right? Well, its initial velocity is this way, okay? That's its angular velocity. Well, you know, use the right-hand rule. Curve your, the fingers of your right hand. Where's your thumb put, point? It points into the page. That means the initial and the angular velocity is negative. Of course it's negative because it's pulling the pendulum in the clockwise direction. Motion in the clockwise direction is negative motion as far as angular motion is concerned. And we see that because we have negative sign. So the angular velocity will remain negative for half a period. And it's only gonna become positive once it comes on the back downswing. So that means since we, we were looking to find the time for a positive angular velocity, we know it has to be greater than one half of a period. So it has to occur over here. On, and you know it has to occur on the way it's kind of coming back up because that will be the very first time it happens. Now, obviously, we're going to achieve that same positive um, angular velocity again over here once it's slowing down. But we, the first time it's going to be achieved is right there. And so if we look then, we have one complete period to add to the value that we got, the negative time value that we got then we'll get a positive value of time that makes physical sense and is correct because it'll be the first time since time equals zero when the pendulum started that that particular velocity is achieved and that particular positive velocity is achieved. Okay, so there's the idea. So we just add time to the absolute value because that'll just, you know, that'll give me what I'm looking for. All right, 
all right? And here, notice I'm adding half a period to the absolute value. I could have also added a full period to the negative value, okay? So this adding half a period to the, to the absolute value of that is the exact same as adding a full period to the negative value of t, okay? Because you, know, you, you get the idea, okay? And so then what number do we get? 1.81 seconds, okay? And again, that's, that's using the correct number of 0 0.479, which is some, for some reason incorrectly written there, okay? In the very small, very small print, okay? All right, so then now we have our correct time. We can then plug that back in because after all, phase angle distractions aside, we were looking for an angle, so an actual angular position when this velocity is occurring, okay? So we're gonna plug this time back into the position function that we found from part A. All right, there we go. And let's plug in the 1.81 seconds. And then we find it has a position of negative 0.592 radians. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, because the first time that the positive velocity is achieved is when the pendulum is to the left of equilibrium. That's negative angular position, okay? I know, the, the signs, you gotta work with the signs. You gotta make sure those, the, that the coordinate system makes sense to you, okay? So there we have it, all right? So now finally on to part C. Part C is less tricky in terms of the coordinate system and just a matter of uh, recalling all the equations to use. All right, so we find tension from the net force equation in the radial direction. And the reason we can use net, um, net force here to find the tension is because we're dealing with a simple pendulum. If, if I, I, would, I don't think I'd do this for a um, physical pendulum, not in this class, but then we'd have to actually use net torque in order to find the tension. But here we don't have to worry about that. All right, so here we have our net force in the radial, um, radial direction. That's this, this force diagram right here. So the tension force is entirely in the radial direction. There you can see the radial direction. That's R, by the way. Positive R is towards the pivot. Then we have a component of the gravitational force, specifically the radial component, which would be negative mg cosine theta. That would then be equal to mac. Remember, ac is the centripetal acceleration, also known as the radial acceleration. Okay? All right, and then we go ahead and just solve for the tension force, and there's our expression. Okay, and this is, you know, this is a well-known expression for the tension force for a simple pendulum. You know, you might, you might recall seeing it, okay? All right, and then notice that this is translational velocity, okay? Now, specifically, it is, it's translational velocity of the center of mass, but since it's a simple pendulum, it's just the translational velocity of the point mass, okay? And then that's equal to omega L, okay? And remember that we're, I, I say omega because that's the way you first saw it, right? We always saw V equals omega L. Right? In other words, translational velocity equals angular velocity times distance to that point that's translating, okay? Well, but remember, now we're not calling angular velocity omega anymore because that's reserved for angular frequency. So then we got theta dot, okay? Is now, you know, angular velocity. Okay, so that means we can go ahead and rewrite this. Notice what I'm doing. So my cosine of theta, well, theta is a function, right? So look, I'm putting then, I'm gonna put my position function inside of cosine. So I'm taking cosine of cosine, all right? For, for real, that's how you do it, okay? And then we've got, um, we have, I took care of the L's, right? Because I have an L squared up top, and then I got L in the denominator, which is, or an L in the numerator. Well, I, excuse me, I have an L squared in the numerator and an L in the denominator, which means it leaves me one L in the numerator. And then we have the expression right here, which is just um, angular velocity, and then there's the full functional form of it, okay? And then don't forget to square it, because after all, this whole expression is squared because V is squared, okay? See, like so. Okay, all right, so that's it. That's, that, that, that is the function. You can't really simplify it any more than that. All right, it's pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. It's the sum of a trig function of a trig function and a, tr and a square of a trig function, okay? But we can plug in times, because after all, the whole purpose of this was just to be able to plug in specific times all right, in this case, we're gonna plug in, and here I'm just highlighting what, what they are, because it is kind of unclear otherwise, right? So blue, the blue becomes that, and the yellow becomes that, okay? Well, you know, yellow, yellow, blue to blue, okay? But anyway, we're gonna plug in our time, all right? So here I've just plugged in one second. Let's use the messy handwriting here. And there it, there it is, our value, 12.8 newtons, okay? Now, well, one thing you could kind of do with this is you could, you could find out, well, what's the maximum tension? How close is this to the maximum tension? Where, where, does, one period, where does one second fall in terms of the actual period of this pendulum, you know, and all, all those kind of things to check your work, right? I, I did that because I want to make sure I wasn't doing a typo. There's a lot of opportunities to just, you know, misinter something in the calculator. So you can think about, you know, the fact that, you know, the, what, what is the length of the period, right? Well, we know the length of the period is, um, is going to be a pi, um, well, two pi divided by 2.37. So let's see, let me see, I'll just calculate it over here. So two pi divided by 2.37. So the approximate period is about 2.65 seconds. So one second, is less um, is is you know less than one half a period, all right. So less than one half a period. Well, it's actually it's actually well two and a half seconds. This thing. So we have so we have a, a period of two and a half seconds. We've gone one second in. Um, so that's mean we've gone. We haven't quite swung all the way to the other side. 
So this, this, this tension here definitely shouldn't be the maximum tension. It seems like we should be somewhere, if we released it over here, we should be somewhere in the swing in this kind of this vicinity, okay? All right. Now, we're gonna find the total translational acceleration of the point mass at that same time, after one second. This is the equation for the total translational acceleration. Look what it becomes. I know it looks, looks messy, right? Looks scary. But this, all it is is that tangential acceleration is just alpha times r, or alpha times l. Alpha here, angular acceleration, is theta double dot. It's a function. And then, and then we have that radial acceleration, we already know, is v squared over l. It's also equal to omega squared times l, right? So radial acceleration is just omega squared times l, which here becomes theta dot squared times, well, times l, okay? And then we have to square that because of the, um, because of the Pythagorean theorem, okay? And so then we're actually gonna end up with a fourth power over here, okay? So let's expand it out a bit, okay? Notice I have, I have the fourth power. All right, I also pulled the L because there's an L squared on both of these. I pulled it out of the square root. And then we just plug in all our numbers. There they are. All right, you just plug, it, plug in all the values, including the one second, the, the, the point at which you're evaluating the total translational acceleration of the point mass. And there you go, 0.42 meters per second squared. Okay, not its greatest value, but you know, fairly, fairly large. Okay, all right, well, there we have it. Hope it all looks good, all right? All right, so let's do some more examples. We're gonna continue on. All right, so this, this one will be a little bit more straightforward. This is just relating a physical pendulum to a simple pendulum. So a uniform beam of length 50 centimeters is allowed to pivot about one end and oscillate with small main angle motion. If the beam is replaced with another shorter uniform beam that is only as long as the distance from the pivot to the center of oscillation of the original beam, what will be the ratio of the original um, beam's angular velocity divided by the angular velocity of the replacement. Okay, now I know that it's a long sentence. Essentially the idea is that we're, we're, we have a physical pendulum, we find its center of oscillation, and then we get a new physical pendulum that is as long as the distance from the pivot to the center of oscillation. So essentially we'd have like the original physical pendulum, then we'd have a shorter one because that's point P. And then we're gonna compare the angular frequency between these two, all right? Kind of neat, right? Okay. All right, so first find the center of oscillation of the pendulum. All right, so we'll set the angular frequency of the beam equal to a simple pendulum. All right, set it up like that. All right, and then go ahead and solve for L because this will be the distance from the pivot to the center of oscillation, all right? And we get that L is two thirds, or you know, curse of L is two thirds of big L, all right? And the idea here is that big L is the length of the physical pendulum, and then little L is the length of the distance of the simple pendulum to the center of oscillation, okay? So we found out that it's two thirds of the length of the actual physical pendulum. Good, looks good. And that, that's, this, is, this is a general result that apply to all uniform beams, okay? All right, and now we're going to replace this, you know, the, um, the not replace, but just kind of, I mean, I guess it is, it is the replacement, right? But we're gonna look for the ratio between them. So we're gonna, now we're gonna have a new physical pendulum that is a length curse of L long. And say so that's that's what you see here. But I don't. I'm not going to use Kurzweil. I'm going to I'm going to have it all in terms of two thirds of the original length. That way I can cancel out the original length and the mass everywhere and and gravity. Look at everything that cancels. All right. And so then I'm just left with this this numerical ratio. And it's just you know a couple steps to simplify it because you got to make sure you're doing all the fractions right. And there you have it. It will be the square root of two thirds as at the time. Okay. So it will not be as long, it will be shorter, and it will be specifically a factor of root two over three shorter, the, the, the original one, right? And, that's, and it's shorter, I guess, or smaller, because we're talking about frequency. The period of the original one will be greater because it's longer, okay? Which makes sense, it totally, it totally makes sense that we should have a smaller value, okay? The bigger one was moving slower because it's longer, and I've replaced it with a shorter one. But we've replaced it with a shorter one that's very specifically shorter, it's as long as the center of oscillation of the first one. Okay, all right. So now let's do another center of oscillation problem, this time for this unusual pendulum, okay? So a thick iron ring is allowed to oscillate about the indicated pivot point. The iron ring is a uniform, is a uniform density, has a mass of 4.4 kilograms, and inner um, and outer radii of the rings are R1 equals 13.5 and R2 equals 16.9 centimeters, respectively. What is the center of oscillation of this physical pendulum, okay? So what's going on here, right? This is, it's a ring, right? So it's a physical pendulum. You, it's gonna kind of, it's gonna like rock back and forth. Like you could, this is like, you know, taking a ring and like putting a nail here and hanging on that nail and then giving it a little push and watching it rock back and forth, okay? That's the frequency we're, in, we're interested in. 
the one where it's going to kind of rock back and forth like that. Okay. And so here, um, these are some numbers to consider. Okay. This is going to be, um, this number here is the diameter of the, of the inner region. This 3.04 is the, the thickness of the ring. It's the distance between R2 and R1. And then notice here, this is the center of oscillation. We'll get back to that because it looks like it's an odd place, doesn't it? Okay. So the moment of inertia of any ring, this is one of the well-known moments of inertia, although one we haven't used too much in this class, is one half m times the, the uh, sum of the radii squared. Okay, so it's not a hoop because the moment of inertia of a hoop would just be mr squared, right? A ring has a different moment of inertia, kind of like it, almost like a cylinder, but with the middle cut out, okay? And so, but that's about the center, by the way, because any, anytime you look at common moments of inertia, they always assume they're about the center, except for the one about the beam from one far end, right? But, you know, you always, you always have to look where, where that moment of inertia is calculated, which means we don't want it there. We want the moment of inertia about this point, which means we need to move the moment of inertia from here to here. Okay? To do that, we're going to use the parallel axis theorem. All right? So we just take the moment of inertia about the center plus the distance from the center to the new location of the pivot, which is just R1, because that's how far we're moving it, a distance of R1. All right? And when we simplify this and co combine like terms, this becomes our new moment of inertia. This is the moment of inertia about the pivot. All right? And then to find the length of the center of oscillation, all right? well, um, which is the distance um, to the center of oscillation, we set the frequency of the physical pendulum equal to a frequency of a simple pendulum, all right, with that length, all right, and then we're just going to solve for that length. We're going to solve for L naught, the distance from the pivot to the center of oscillation, okay? Notice here, H is the distance from the pivot to the center of mass of the system. Well, obviously, the center of the mass of the system is the center, so that means the distance from the center of mass or from the pivot to the center of mass is just R1. You can see in the figure, okay? So I square both sides to get rid of the square roots, and then I'm just going to solve for L naught, all right, the, which is the center of oscillation, plug in the numbers, and I get 0 0.308 meters. Wow, that's the weird thing, because look at it, right? I have 27 centimeters of distance from the pivot to the, 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 in, the, the final bottom of the inside ring, right? And then the thickness between them is 3.04, which means that this distance here is 30.04, okay? 30.04 centimeters. Well, what did I get for here? I got 30.8 centimeters. So I got a greater, I got a greater distance than the total, then that means that the center of oscillation of the ring is not contained within the ring itself. It's actually down below, just slightly, below the ring. That means that rings, when hung like this, now you could put the pivot somewhere else, like up here, but when hung in this particular way, don't have a percussion point, right? This would make a really bad instrument because it would always make, it make a discordant sound. There's nowhere you could hit it to make a nice pure ringing sound. Because if you do have that translational motion at the pivot or an attempted translational motion, that's gonna create you know, like kind of secondary vibrations and that makes discordant sound. All right, so it's, it's, really, it's really a neat idea. It was such a cool discovery when I was writing this problem. Okay, all right. So now in our final example, we're gonna go back to this physical pendulum but actually do some time dependent stuff with it. All right, so the idea here. So a thick iron ring, right, allowed to oscillate, same point as before. The iron ring is uniform, same masses, same lengths. Okay. So if the ring is pivoted so that a line from the pivot point to the center of mass makes a 20 degree angle with the vertical, what will be the velocity function of the simple harmonic motion of the ring after the force is removed? Okay, so in part A, we're just looking for the function, right? Which is a common question in these types of problems. All right, so the idea is that we've, we've tilted the ring 20 degrees up, right? So we've, we've tilted it and then we're gonna release it from rest. These red lines represent the position of the ring after it's tilted, okay? And then it's gonna swing back down and it's gonna swing back and forth, right? So swing here. It will swing back and forth like this, okay? All right, so you get the idea, okay? And the position function in this case would be this, okay? And then we're gonna convert the initial 20 degrees into um, radians. Now the 20 degrees is pushing it a little bit because technically it's bigger than 15, but we'll let it fly this time, all right? And then we're gonna go, go ahead and find the angular frequency, all right? And so all I'm doing here is this, you know, this is just the moment of inertia that we, that we already know from the previous example. We already know the distance from the pivot to the center mass is R1. So then we can find the angular frequency pretty easily, and it's 5.64 radians per second, all right? And then we're just gonna say, okay, well then we're gonna, we want the angular, um, all right? So we, we actually, we weren't asked for the position function, we were asked for the uh, velocity function, right? Okay, so we'll go ahead and then do the velocity function, which is theta dot, all right? And then just plug, plug in our, our values, right? Plug in, plug in our 5.64 for the angular frequency, plug in our amplitude of pi over nine radians, 
and then plugging the 5.64 again within the sine function. We'll simplify everything in front because we want to might make this look like it's in units of radians, um, radians per second to clearly show um, that it is um, the, the amplitude of the angular frequency, the maximum angular um, frequency, or excuse me, the, ma maxim the amplitude of the angular velocity, the maximum angular velocity. And it's 1.97 radians per second. That's how fast we'll be going at the bottom, of course, because that's where all the potential energy has converted the kinetic energy. And there we have it. There is our position function. And we can plug in any particular time and find out how fast it's moving. All right? Okay. And we know kind of, you know, how it's going to be going negative at first and then become positive after half a swing and so on. All right. It looks good. Now in part B, what will be the angular acceleration of the ring when the velocity is one radian per second? This is the same sort of kind of um, problem that I've asked a few times. We have to use one function to find time. So use an inverse trig function, actually get the time outside of the function. And then whatever time we get, plug that back into the other function. In this case, we're going to find time from velocity and then plug that value of time into the angular acceleration function. Okay? All right, which we haven't, we haven't done that particular version of it yet. So we're looking for the first time that the angular velocity is negative one radians per second. Okay. Now it's always the first time because again you can find any infinite number of solutions as it will repeat over and over again. So when I, when I ask, some, I I, I want to specify and I try to specify, but here I didn't. So you should assume it's the first time. All right, which will be on the initial downswing, right? Because remember, because the initial velocity is negative, and so this is and its its maximum is faster, right? It's at the very bottom of the swing. It's going negative one point nine seven. So this is about halfway down on its initial downswing. It's actually not quite half because it's not linear, but you get the idea, all right? And so we'll set it up like this, all right? Divide both sides by negative 1.97, like so. Take an inverse trig function and solve for time. And we get all right, a fraction of a second. And that's because th this particular ring doesn't have a very large period, okay? And then we'll plug that into our angular acceleration function, all right? Theta double dot. And what are we going to get? Negative 9.81 radians per second squared. That's the angular acceleration. Some, some fraction of the way down on the first downswing. All right, pretty cool, right? Okay, well this finally brings a conclusion to our lecture on the simple harmonic uh, motion of pendulums. Um, I, pendulums are such an interesting system. They, they're such a wonderful illustration of mechanics. I really can't think of a better system. And I hope it has been um, interesting and informative and you've enjoyed the lecture. Thank you so much for watching.